Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm Poppy, so I'm the communications manager on the project. I think I recognise quite a few of your names, so I won't dwell on that. So, um, yep, yeah, here's our April progress webinar for the UKRI Net Zero Digital Research Infrastructure Scoping Project. So, there's a mouthful. Um, so, hopefully, you're all in the right place. So, a couple of quick housekeeping things. So, um, you're all doing a fantastic job of staying muted, so that's great. Um, you're welcome to have your video on, but just bear in mind that the um, slides have been recorded. So if you unmute yourself and say anything, then your face might be recorded. So turn your video off if you don't want that. Um, so to ask questions, we'll take questions at the end. You can either use the raise hand function or you can just send a message in the Zoom chat. Um, and yeah, I've already said about recording. Um, so a quick reminder about who we are. So we are all based within the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis. This is your core team, plus we've got one more person, Katie, who we haven't added to this slide yet. So Katie is our, um, our, another project manager who's joined the team. So um, we welcome you all to introduce yourselves in the chat so we can know who's in the room. That would be lovely to yeah, learn a bit more about you. So feel free to do that throughout. That's great. Um, okay, so a quick agenda for today. So we're going to remind you about all of the activities that we're undertaking in the project. We'll talk about some of the key progress that we've done so far. Um, since last time we gave an update, we'll have a short Q&A session at the end. And then we really want to have a bit of a two-way discussion with everyone about effective interactive engagement and community building. So a reminder about what the project activities are. So the project will collect evidence um, via all these different activities on the screen to provide recommendations for the roadmap for how UKRI, UKRI's digital research infrastructure can reach net zero. So um, I think we're gonna touch on most of these today, but not all of them. Um, so I won't dwell on these, but if you've got any questions, then we can cover them at the end. And a quick reminder that our website's got lots of information about these on it too. So uh, we're gonna do a bit of a tag team today. So first up, Charlotte is going to, actually that's a lie, we've changed this order, that's a complete lie. We're not gonna talk about sound tips until the end. So we're gonna go um, interim findings, first of all with Charlotte and Martin, and then we're gonna go consortium building and then talk about some stakeholder stuff that we've done. And then we're gonna talk about the Sandfit events and then uh, introduce you to what we want to talk about in the discussion. So over to you, uh, Charlotte. Um, okay, so um, we've written a zero order draft for our interim findings that are mostly based on literature that we've been reading. Um, and uh, there's, uh, this slide is really to sort of introduce the kind of overall framing of that and some elements of uh, what we're introducing there. Um, we um, have thought about how we frame the problem of net zero in terms of um, the different elements of the carbon footprint um, and how we think about our target, whether it's net zero or actual zero, because I think there are some elements of our uh, DRI ecosystem that we really should be aiming for actual zero. Um, where the digital research infrastructures fit in terms of the circular economy and what happens to our infrastructures at the end of their useful life. Um, and also how all this fits within the greenhouse gas protocol and the different scopes for how we think about um, carbon emissions. Um, some key findings are related to um, how we expect digitally enabled research to expand greatly, um, that the global information communication technology and EG use is very, widely varying um, that we need short-term action if we want to meet our long-term goals um, and that metrics and evaluation will play a central role but also we need to be careful about 
what metrics and how we use and how we evaluate them so that we don't risk some unintended consequences of uh, any metrics we advocate. And that all of this sits within an evolving technical and societal environmental context. I mean, the scope of the project is recommendations up to 2040. So obviously um, uh, the environment and the technology technology that we um, have will change. And some of that is uh, discussed in our section four about risks and how we manage transformations. Um, section five is about other initiatives. So um, uh, I'm not going into those here, but there are other initiatives globally and nationally about how we achieve net zero. Um, and then a section on recommendations. So for instance, what zones would be useful for targeting action in terms of energy efficiency, sustainable power, um, how we think about supply chains and what we do about unavoided emissions. Um, so you can contribute to all of this by telling us about literature that you think is relevant via our literature survey link. Um, if you'd like to see the current zero order draft, you can send an email to our support email address at CEDA. Um, and it's due to be published in July and there'll be opportunities for wider review then. There's a message from Mari. Um, who is the intended audience of this report? And if it will become publicly available document? Um, Yes, it will become a publicly available document, um, certainly when it is published in July. Um, it's currently being viewed by our science advisory board. We aim it to be useful for our stakeholders and we'll be talking about stakeholders later on in this um, meeting. Will it cover all the areas set out in this slide before this. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean, Mari, Mary. Yes, Mary means um, the activities in the previous slide. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to go back. Uh, on this one, Mary, is that the one you mean? Yeah. Martin, will it cover all of these areas? Uh, it won't cover proof of concept studies and workshops because those won't have happened in July. Um, they won't have the full mapping of the existing infrastructure that won't have happened. Um, it's not gonna talk about the engagement with stakeholders. It's not a, a report on the activity. It's, it's more about the, the outcomes in terms of recommendations for the infrastructure. Um, there might be some initial results from the case studies, but that work is just getting started. So it's mainly going to be based on the literature survey. Um, I'm kind of seeing it as like an initial findings report rather than a, a progress so far report. That's right. It, it is It is for the stakeholders. So it's, um, yeah, initial findings. That's a good way of putting it. Um, there's another question from Mary. It says, will it cover an approach to mapping so that it can be critiqued? To mapping? As in the mapping of existing infrastructures, I guess. It's mainly the literature. So based on a literature survey, it's not about what we're doing in the project. So it's the... We, we have a number of bodies reviewing how we work and we're engaging with the community, but we're not doing everything through this report. And we should say this project, the aim of this project is to produce a report, which we said will be a public report. And that report is about recommendations for a roadmap. It's not gonna be you know, about the project. It's about what we, 
believe and recommend that um, UKRI should do with digital research infrastructure. And, and this is the first step in that direction. And so we've put in this uh, midway report, part of the reasons for doing this is that we're aware, aware that people are in the process of making decisions about what they'll do next year. And we wanted to take information which is is readily available from the literature and put it together in a form that gives people an overview of, of the direction we're heading in um, before the end of this year so that people have information in place for decisions they might make over the, the summer and the autumn. Um, even though there's no specific timetable for UKRI decision making in this space, because they are, of course, reacting to other things going on in Treasury and Bays and, and other government departments. But we're just making information early to a wide audience also because the decision making process in UKRI is, is quite diffuse. Thanks, Martin. I think that helps clarify things. Um, Charlotte, have you finished with this slide? Um, I have, yes, thanks. There you go, next one. Okay, so one of the things we talked about is that things we do now, uh, different sorts of things we do now have an influence in the near and the medium and the long term. So uh, things we do soon in terms of, well, now in terms of policy, will have a influence soon. So um, things like um, open data policy um, will have near immediate uh, impact in terms of being able to uh, reuse data. Um, things we do now in terms of building business cases, say for uh, ultra low carbon machine rooms for um, highly energy intensive computation that will begin to have a um, impact in the medium term and then things we do now in terms of research we imagine that would have an impact in a longer time frames for instance the development of uh, very large chips that are becoming available now but have been in the research uh, and development for um, some time. Um, but noting that policy that we introduced today uh, may not have an immediate action. So for instance, if we have policy on purchasing and procurement, then that will only really begin to have an effect when people buy things. Okay, um, next slide, please. This one's I think this is Martin. You're muted. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to say something about modal transitions uh, because there are quite a lot of areas where we have this combination of new technology and adaptions in community behavior. Um, many of us are probably familiar with the idea of modal transition in transport. So we have a lot of transport by car and plane. And it can be much more efficient, reduce our carbon footprint by moving to bikes, bus, and trains. But that huge saving comes with a loss of flexibility and it's, it's not easy or not everybody can adapt. We go on to the next, set this through. There's a similar problem with chip technology. A lot of people are working on combination of CPUs and disks. Uh, we now have a lot of alternatives around accelerators in the forms of GPUs and also there's something called intelligent processor units. units. Um, free field programmable data arrays, wafer scale engines, and also tape and SSD for storage. These offer much greater energy efficiency, but there are issues about how they use them. The, the uh, pattern of services that they support is different. Uh, next, please. There's a similar issue about how we organize our meetings. Or if we meet in conference centers, which is great, everybody gets together, or do it through webinars and online discussions. 
the webinars are very efficient, but I think people are noticing gaps, things that don't happen that would have happened if everybody had got together in a conference center and we need to think about how to fill in those gaps. Um, next, please. This one, there are some question marks in this one. But one of the things we're looking at in this project is there are many ways in which we can make work on our computers more efficient. But that in itself will not reduce the power consumption unless we also have an idea about how we scale the overall capacity or the overall um, power of the machines. Um, so I feel that we have to move in some way from looking at the computational power as the, the measure of the system and look at its problem solving capacity. But that, that is quite difficult to measure at the moment. And there's a comment, the peak floating point operation rate is, is losing meaning with all these different heterogeneous architectures, but it's unclear how we replace it and, and what our ambition in terms of the infrastructure should be directed towards. Next slide, please. So um, we're making a bit of progress on in terms of the consortium building. We have a group from the University College London who are engaged in public policy advice in relation to sustainability and um, carbon mitigation. And they, they will help us to frame the port report in a way which can go beyond the technology problems and really get at how policy is implemented. Uh, University of Glasgow um, Sustainable Computing Group uh, will contribute some expertise on chip architecture. We have somebody from Edge Hill University uh, with more of a sociological background to try and really reach out to the entire community because it's we feel it's important not just to contact the people who come along to meetings because they're interested in that zero we also need to contact people who are are not keen to turn up and dis discuss these issues we have several people from the stf stfc scientific computing department who are getting started on mapping the existing digital research infrastructure in step study of jasmine and our also very interested in all aspects of the project. And the same applies for Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre. They'll work specifically on the in-depth study of Archer, but are of course, of course also interested in, in everything else. Um, next slide, please. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, we briefly want to touch on stakeholders today as we've started to look into the project internal and external stakeholders. Um, so firstly, we wanted to look at the definition and how we define stakeholders. So we use the APM Chartered Body Project Profession, um, which says those individuals or groups who have an interest or role in the project or are impacted by it, but who are outside the control of the project. Their stakes, including the roles that they will play, are part of the landscape that guides a project to successful completion. Um, so yeah, we've started to sort of categorize them, uh, categorize the stakeholders, um, but this is still work in progress at the moment. And hopefully by the next webinar, we'll be able to give you a bit more detailed information on the stakeholders and how far we've progressed with mapping the stakeholders. So yeah, that's all on the project stakeholder definition for today. Thanks. I'll, I'll just respond to a question that David Hooper has raised in the chat um, about the Met Office. Who back in 2020 were considering moving their data center to a country with better access to renewable energy. I think in the end they've they've decided to move to Microsoft who have a very um, detailed and, and comprehensive approach to, to net zero. Um, we will in our project be looking at how their approach compares with what 
STFC and the University of Edinburgh and other universities are doing to, to evaluate that in a bit more detail. Um, the idea of moving to another country is raises some quite complex policy issues. Um, I think at the moment people are, are keen to keep things in the UK, but there is at the same time increasing use of global cloud resources. And that is clearly a developing area as well. Yep. Okay. Um, Charlotte, I think back to you for the sandpit announcement, which I'm sure lots of people here are interested to hear about. Okay. Um, so we've got two sandpits that we intend to run in May, and they'll be run online. Um, they are two um, events running, um, well, each sandpit will run over two days. Um, and uh, they will just be through the morning, say from nine until 2 p.m. Actually quite a lot of the day, but not the entire day. Um, and those are for allocating funding for both the workshops and proof of concept studies. And these are things where we uh, want the community to come to us with ideas of um, uh, things that they can do to contribute to our ambition of creating a roadmap for uh, net zero for digital research infrastructures. Um, so the first sandpit is where we expect to think about community and organizational challenges such as um, our user facing services, how we do data management, managing behavior change, what training is needed, um, how we think about the proportionality of energy use, um, is the work we do on our digital research infrastructures uh, proportional to the energy it uses um, in terms of its usefulness. And are there any winners and losers and how we can do monitoring and how we can use monitoring to drive change. Now, these are ideas that we've come up with. You might bring your own, but that's an idea of uh, the problem space that we hope to address in the first group of uh, sandpits. And the second sandpit, we're thinking more along the lines of technical and operational challenges. So things to do with procuring hardware, um, how we design our infrastructure and its architecture, um, how we use cloud platforms and consolidation of our services, um, thinking about power management and power efficiency, um, the end of life for our digital research infrastructures and the circular economy, and how we use carbon capture for any unavoided emissions. Simon Lambert has a question. Does sandpit application mean application to take part in the sandpit or a proposal for the workshop? Okay, so the sandpit applications are for your ideas of things to come to the uh, workshop to uh, discuss. Um, and that uh, is a application process that's open now and that closes on the 25th of April. And we expect a short abstract from people who want to apply to come to the sandpits. And then the full proposal, uh, we expect those um, mid-June. Now, um, Poppy, tell me about that final proposal deadline. Um, I, um, I think 13th of June, is the date that Martin you said all of the full detail forms need to be in but at the end of the sandpit week there will be like a one pager kind of application method by whatever idea has been agreed within the sandpit events within the teams that have um that's right so basically straight after the sandpit we want people to write up based on the discussions they've had at the sandpit a a scientific description of, of the work they want to do. And then there'll be um, a couple of weeks after, then there'll be a panel review 
uh, and people will get some feedback from the panel. And then there'll be a couple of weeks or up until the 13th of June to work out the complete costings and get any internal proposal, propo sorry, any internal approval that people need for the costings of their project. So on the 13th of June, we have a fully costed description of work for all the projects. And that should then be a, a formality at that stage if they've already, if the scientific work's already been approved by the, the panel. Um, Mary wants to know how many applicants we have so far. One. <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> I'm kind of expected to be honest with the deadline not um, here yet. Yeah. Um, um, question from Erin Mupp. What, when would the project be expected to start? Um, from July to September. The main thing is they should finish um, by December, I think we said. Yeah. So, yeah, that depends on the project. The, the workshop hostings projects can be quite short, although we do, um, if people are hosting a workshop, the, it's important that there's a proper planning and a proper write-up of the workshop. So we have some conclusions to feed back in the, into the recommendations. Um, but yeah, the, the, the main thing is to try and get the work finished this calendar year. Um. We've got a question. What is the level of funding for the projects? Yes, I forgot to put that on here. I don't have the numbers in my mind at this moment. So we have £500,000 for the proof of concept studies, and we're expecting to fund of the order of five studies. It depends a little bit on the ideas that come forward. And we have 210000 I believe, for the the workshops, um, we had about eight thematic areas. Some of them could be combined if people feel that themes go together. So, so up to eight, eight workshops splitting around just over 200,000 pounds. Lots of questions, which is great. Okay, I can't see any more questions in the chat. Charlotte, was there anything else you wanted to flag? Um, no, just that, to remind people that they're based on themes and that, uh, you, that we will be combining people with ideas for workshops and people with ideas for proof of concept studies in each of those samples. Yeah, so that there is a bit more on the website and one of the reasons we're outsourcing the workshop hosting rather than doing it ourselves is because we want people to not only uh, organize the workshop, but also think about the community that they need to engage with and, and how to draw people from that community into a meeting and engage them in a, a discussion on, on the different themes. And we don't in our group have the necessary expertise to link to all these different communities. So that's why we have this sort of two-stage process of of inviting people to come along with plans to engage to deliver these meetings and engage different parts of the DRI community. Thanks Martin. Okay so I think we've probably wrapped up on that. Oh hang on I just spotted another question. Is this UKRI or NERC funding e.g. does demand management apply? This is UKRI funding administered by NERC. I'm afraid I'm not sure what um, is meant by demand management in the question. No, I'm not sure either. Um, what institution sifts out who can apply? Not sure. Maybe if there's anyone from, I think we've got a few NERC UKRI people, if you know how to answer that, if you could answer that in the chat, that would be great. 
Um, yeah. Come on. Our institution is actually STFC, but uh... it doesn't look confusing, mess. Let's not go into that, Martin. <laughs> and the funding is going through Leeds. Oh, well. Okay. Michael says so. We can have several applications from any given applying institution. Ah. Uh, yes. Okay. I believe so. Yes. Um. And the idea of the sand pit, I guess, is to to share out, to try and get people to form teams, so it's not too focused in one institution. If there are several institutions interested in an area, but we don't have any uh, upfront restrictions on institutions. Okay, noted about putting it on the website. We'll add that. Mm -hmm. um, needs weeks to support applications. That's fine. If you need anything clarified by us, send us an email. And yeah, if there's anything that you think that we need to particularly put on the website, then we can. That's fine. Thank yeah. you. I love your comments. That's useful. Right. I'm gonna skip on because we've we've added the questions into the into the into the slides, but that's fine. Um, okay. So we said at the beginning that at the end of today we wanted to have a bit of a discussion about how we can um, enable in effective interactive engagement and better build our community. So for context, um, this is related to the samples. They're really short periods of time where we want new teams to be formed and working together. Um, it's all going to be on Zoom, so it's going to be an online environment. So we want your opinions on the best way to do this and the best ways for everyone to interact together. So um, the outcome of the discussion from today will help us to shape how we run the sample events and what tools we use and things like that. So um, we're not going to have that discussion now. We're going to have time for a Q&A, but I think we might have done most of the Q&A. Um, so we can come back to that in a second. So before we do the Q&A, there's a couple of reminders. So a reminder that uh, this is the link to the website. There's lots of information there. Again, like you've mentioned in the chat, if anything's missing, do let us know and we can update it. Um, the Sandpit application deadline is the 25th of April. Um, anyone can subscribe to our mailing list. There's several versions, but if you subscribe on our website, then that's just the general mailing list. Um, follow us on Twitter if you want some updates. And a reminder that at the moment, the next webinar like this is scheduled for the 26th of May. Um, but I have a feeling I might be on leave, so we might need to change that date. Um, okay. Have we got any questions? 